You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. I was left between the picket lines. There I was all night with none but the dead, save now and then a ghoul in gray searching the dead and stripping them of their clothing. If seen by our pickets, they were fired upon and driven away. The night was long and dark to me. I thought, if the boys could, they would come for me. Toward morning, a man in gray came near me. He appeared to be looking about, but not trying to strip any bodies. He stood looking at me, and I put out my hand and touched his foot. He jumped as if surprised. He probably thought me dead. On recovering, he stooped over, asked me where I was shot, if I was cold, and got a blanket, placed it under me, and covered me with two more. He sat by me some time, talking, till it began to be light, then gave me his canteen of water, saying he must get back to his post. Private John B. Stowe, 9th Massachusetts Light Artillery, 1st Volunteer Brigade, Artillery Reserve, Army of the Potomac. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode 362 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. After the sun set on the evening of Thursday, July 2nd, 1863, darkness covered the battlefield at Gettysburg and Lieutenant George Benedict of the 12th Vermont later remembered how he heard an unforgettable sound that rolled over the crest of Cemetery Ridge, where he and his comrades were resting. He likened the sound to, quote, a low, steady, indescribable moan. It came from hundreds of voices calling out, pleading for help or for water. It was the voices of the dying and wounded men who lay suffering in the darkness. Death had stalked the battlefield at Gettysburg on July 2nd, leaving victims from one end of the lines to the other, from Devil's Den and Little Round Top to the wheat field and peach orchard, along the Emmitsburg Road and Cemetery Ridge, up to Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. To Benedict and the others who had been spared, the wounded men's cries for help, quote, mingled with prayers and groans, were literally heartrending. During the night of July 2nd, aided by a moon just past full, ambulance crews, assisted by soldiers searching for friends, roamed the fields and woodlots, gathering up the wounded. In the darkness, hour after hour, the ambulances passed to the rear and returned for more human cargo. In some spots on the battlefield, an informal truce prevailed, as men on picket duty from both armies allowed stretcher bearers from either side to pass through the lines. An officer said, quote, It was the saddest night on picket duty that I ever passed. Soldiers felt responsible for the men of their own company, often hometown friends from before the war, and whenever they could, they made their way in ones and twos back to the scene of the day's fighting in search of fallen comrades. 
and sometimes they went out, not in search of friends, but relatives. On one such melancholy mission was a Mississippian, J.W. Duke, who at last located his brother, lying mortally wounded in the peach orchard. His brother gasped, Thank God, my prayers are answered. I have asked him to take me in place of you, as I am prepared and you are not. A federal staff officer found Confederate Brigadier General William Barksdale among the fallen. A former congressman and fiery advocate of secession, Barksdale had led his brigade of Mississippians forward as part of the rebel assault on the Peach Orchard and Cemetery Ridge. He fell wounded, and when his men were driven back, he was left behind. He had been shot in the back, and two bullets had broken his left leg. A stretcher crew carried Barksdale back to the Jacob Hummelbaugh farm, back near the Tawny Town Road, where surgeons from the Federal Second Corps had established a field hospital. Dr. A.T. Hamilton of the 148th Pennsylvania attended to Barksdale, who several times asked if his wounds were mortal, and Hamilton told him yes, he would not survive them. Barksdale died on July 3rd. The suffering men of both sides who were removed from the field ended the night's journey, as Barksdale had, at either a house or a barn converted into a makeshift hospital. The stream of stretchers and ambulances seemed endless. The officer in charge of the 5th Corps ambulances reported that from 4 p.m. on the 2nd to 4 a.m. on the morning of the 3rd, 81 ambulances brought in 1,300 wounded men to his corps' hospitals. The field hospitals were scenes of appalling suffering. On both sides of the lines, the surgeons and their assistants worked all night on the flood of wounded. A doctor from Georgia scribbled in his diary, quote, I did not sleep a moment last night. A soldier from New York said that words could not describe Quote, the frightful picture of a field hospital. A Pennsylvanian who visited a third corps hospital in a barn at dawn on the third said it reminded him of a Philadelphia slaughterhouse. During the night, Lieutenant Benedict was sent to the rear to get ammunition for the Vermonters. Not knowing the location of the ordnance wagons, Benedict went from spot to spot in the darkness, including a barn where outside he saw, quote, a ghastly pile of amputated arms and legs. Sometime during the night, perhaps even before midnight, some of the musicians and the bands in the Federal Army were ordered to place themselves between the troops on the lines and the hospitals. A captain in a New York regiment recalled how, quote, they played by detachments all night to drown out the cries of the wounded and those who were being operated upon. Inside the federal lines near Little Round Top, Private John Mosley of the 4th Alabama received assistance from his captors in writing a final letter home. My dear mother, I am here a prisoner of war and mortally wounded. I can live but a few hours more at farthest. I was shot within 40 yards of the enemy's lines. They have been exceedingly kind to me. I hope I may live long enough to hear the shouts of victory before I die. Farewell to you all. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. 
Every week we tackle fascinating topics. We go back to source materials in their original languages. And we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. For the civilians living in Gettysburg and the surrounding area, July 2nd had been a day full of anxiety and uncertainty. Michael Jacobs, the math professor at Pennsylvania College, admitted that, quote, To us who were at the time within the rebel lines, the result seemed doubtful and gloomy forebodings filled our minds. The unearthly yells of the exultant and defiant enemy had, during the afternoon, been frequently heard, even amidst the almost deafening sounds of exploding cannon, of screaming and bursting shells, and the continuous roar of musketry. And it seemed to us, judging from the character and direction of these mingled noises, that the enemy had been gaining, essentially, on our flanks. Intensely anxious to know, we had no means of finding out the relative condition of the two armies. Thirteen-year-old Billy Bailey and his parents lived on a farm three miles west of Gettysburg, and on July 1st, he and his mother had almost been trapped by the fighting while visiting an uncle in town. On the 2nd, Billy, from a safe distance, got a look at the battle raging south of town. I had stood during the day looking from a point of vantage over the battlefield, but the movements of the forces fighting there could not be distinguished, partly because of the distance, but more particularly because of the clouds of smoke that hung over the whole field. A flash of flame and the angry crack of guns a few seconds afterwards indicated where the opposing forces were engaged. Billy continues, Just before nightfall, I had the sensation of a lifetime. There was a thunder of guns, shrieking, whistling, moaning of shells before they burst, sometimes like rockets in the air. No results of the conflicts would be noted. It was simply noise, flash, and roar, the roar of a continuous thunderstorm and the sharp, angry flashes of the thunderbolt. The firing ceased. All was as uncanny in its silence as the noise had been satanic in its volume. In Gettysburg that frightful Thursday, Sarah Broadhead and her husband Joseph huddled in their neighbor's cellar, listening to the thunder of artillery on the nearby battlefield. Confederate soldiers occupied the town, of course, and sharpshooters kept up a constant fire against their federal counterparts who were holding the houses in the southern part of Gettysburg. This musket fire from both sides made the town's yards and streets places of deadly peril. That night, Sarah wrote in her diary, When the noise subsided, we tried to get something to eat. My husband went to the garden and picked a mess of beans, Though stray firing was going on all the time, and bullets from sharpshooters whizzed about his head. He persevered until he picked all, for he declared the rebels should have none. I baked a pan of shortcake and boiled a piece of ham. We had not felt like eating before, being worried by danger and excitement. 
The quiet did not last long. About 4 o'clock p.m., the storm burst again with terrific violence. It seemed as though heaven and earth were being rolled together. For better security, we went to the house of a neighbor and occupied the cellar. Whilst there, a shell struck the house, but mercifully did not burst, but remained embedded in the wall, one half protruding. About six o'clock, the cannonading lessened, and we, thinking the fighting for the day was over, came out. Then the noise of musketry was loud and constant, and made us feel quite as bad as the cannonading, though it seemed to me less terrible. Very soon the artillery joined in the din, and we again retreated to our friend's underground apartment, and remained until the battle ceased, about ten o'clock that night. We expect to be compelled to leave town tomorrow, as the rebels say it will most likely be shelled. I cannot sleep, and as I sit down to write, to while away the time, my husband sleeps as soundly as though nothing was wrong. I wish I could rest so easily, but it is out of the question for me either to eat or sleep under such terrible excitement and such painful suspense. We know not what the morrow will bring forth. For the survivors of the combat on July 2nd, little else mattered other than food and sleep. With no cooking fires allowed, the troops chewed on hardtack, a square, quarter-inch thick cracker made of unleavened flour. However, on the federal side, in a number of regiments and batteries, there had been no resupply of rations for several days, and so officers and men had nothing to eat. Sleep came easily to most of them as exhaustion from the day's exertions overcame them. Many of them used their knapsacks as pillows, and all slept on their arms, that is, they bedded down with their weapons beside them, within reach. Some were required to stay awake, though. The pickets of both sides, from one end of the lines to the other, passed the hours of the long night as best they could, sometimes conversing with their enemy counterparts across the way, who in some places were less than 70 yards away. Others were active in the hours before dawn. The 1st Texas of Robertson's brigade had been ordered to move from Devil's Den to the base of Big Round Top. But before the Texans made the move, a detail of officers and men crawled to the crest of Hawks Ridge to retrieve the three 10-pounder Parrot rifles of Smith's 4th New York Light Artillery Battery, which the rebels had captured earlier in the day at Devil's Den. Speaking in whispers, the Texans wrapped blankets around the wheels of the guns and somehow managed to drag the three rifles down the western slope of Hawks Ridge without alerting the Yankees on Little Round Top. Also active that night on the southern portion of the battlefield were Confederate artillerists whose labors were directed by Colonel Edward Porter Alexander. The 28-year-old Georgian, a West Pointer, was one of the finest artillery commanders in the Army of Northern Virginia. Although only a battalion commander, he was exceptionally bright and capable, and Longstreet had given Alexander battlefield control of his corps' batteries on July 2nd. After nightfall, Alexander was exhausted, but he still needed to see to the countless details of the after-action work and preparing for the inevitable resumption of the battle the next day. There were wounded to be cared for and dead to be buried, horses to be fed or put out of their misery, ammunition to be resupplied, and men to be provided with some food and rest. There would be little rest for Alexander himself, who took care of the task that needed to be seen to immediately and then rode to Longstreet's headquarters near Pitzer's Woods. Longstreet told him that Robert E. Lee had issued orders for a renewal of the attack the next day, Friday, July 3rd. Alexander later recalled he was told, quote, that we would renew the attack early in the morning, that Pickett's division would arrive and would assault the enemy's line. My impression is the exact point for the attack was not designated, but I was told it would be to our left of the Peach Orchard. 
Alexander rode back to Sherfy's now thoroughly trashed peach orchard, fashioned a rough bed from two fence rails, and, quote, with my saddle for a pillow and with dead men and horses of the enemy all around, I got two hours of good, sound, and needed sleep, end quote. But before 3 a.m., he rose, resaddled his mount, and waited for the arrival of the additional batteries that were going to be coming up. Then, as those guns arrived, Alexander placed them in a line north of the peach orchard. Those preparations were completed by four o'clock, or shortly thereafter. The eastern sky was already beginning to lighten, and the sun would break the horizon in less than 45 minutes. Alexander, with his Confederate gunners, could now only wait. For all of them, July 3rd, the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg, would be a day unlike any other they had ever experienced. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Gettysburg, Day 3, by Jeffrey D. Wirt. The third day at Gettysburg is best remembered for Pickett's Charge, of course. But on July 3rd, there was also hours of combat on Culp's Hill, some deadly and heavy skirmishing between the lines throughout the morning, and no less than four cavalry engagements. And Jeffrey Wirt covers all of that in his excellent and highly readable book on the third day of the battle. Don't forget you can find all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Also at the website, you can find information about joining the ranks of the Strawfoot Brigade and supporting the podcast in that way. This past week, some of you did just that. So a big thank you to Private Smeller, Steve A., Patrick O., and Reed S., Sabine M., Timothy R., and Brett M. And thanks to Paul S. and C.S. Ceramics for their donations this past week. Thanks, y'all. And thanks to everyone for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861-1865, to a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope that you join us again next time as we continue with the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.